Okay, this is chapter two from my tome, 500 page tome, Writing Beyond Realism, Ishika Jun and the Case Against Modern Japanese Literature, a Critical Study with New Translations. Chapter two begins on page 60. And let's see, here we go. Um, page 62. Chapter 2, The Rise of Shajitsu Shugi in Modern Japan. The central thesis of this book is that Ishikawa's early writings represent a counterpoint or counter discourse to Shajitsu Shugi, literally the system of copying actuality, which Ishikawa correctly saw to be the founding notion and default mode of modern Japanese literature. This chapter provides an overview of the origins and development of literary realism in Japan. It begins by introducing the basic terms germane to my discussion, shōsetsu, fictional narrative, mimesis, both primary and secondary, realism, shizen shugi, or naturalism, hōngi, poetic essences, and genbun ichi, the modern vernacular style, and then traces the movements and mutations of realism in modern Japan. The chapter lays the groundwork for the close exegetical readings offered in subsequent chapters. The first, pertin the first term pertinent to our discussion is shōsetsu. Often translated as novel, shōsetsu is better described as a piece of fictional narrative. Modern Japanese shōsetsu is doubly complex due to having two separate sources of origin, East Asian and Western. The Japanese term shōsetsu derives from the Chinese term xiao shuo, which first appeared in distant antiquity as a word meaning small talk. Eventually, it came to mean a narrative or historical account, as seen in the term haishi shōsetsu or baishi xiao shuo, or unorthodox histories in pre-modern China, as opposed to the seishi or zheng shi official histories. The earliest record of its appearance is said to be in the following passage in the Zhuangzi, uh, th written around 310 BC, and the passage is, If you parade your little theories, your little xiaoshuo, to fish for renown, you will be far away from the great Dao, the Da, da Dao. In Japan, the first the term first appeared, shōsetsu, first appeared in the 18th century to describe Chinese vernacular stories of the Ming period, 1368 to 1644, and the early part of the Qing period, 1644 to 1912, as well as their subsequent Japanese adaptations as yomihong, or historical narratives. For, um, and there's a note there, um, what's his name, Tuck, Robert Tuck mentions this in his book, and I have a note to his um, description of uh, the origins of this term. From the start, as it did in China, the term carried negative connotations stemming from its association with fanciful, fanciful fabrications and was regarded as light entertainment, pleasure-inducing stuff for women and children on Nagodomo. There were notable exceptions to this rule. <clears throat> Motori Norinaga, for instance, famously defended the value of fiction and fabrications in his essays Ashiwake o Bune, A Small Boat Punting Through the Reed, 1757, and Iso no Kami no Sasame Goto, Personal Views on Poetry, 1763, citing the 11th century Genji Monogatai tale of Genji as the high point in Japanese writing and thus challenging Buddhist and Confucian views that the sole purpose of writing was to convey moral law. Okay, that date, that first date for Ashiwake Obune might be 1759, I have to check on that. Uh, but such acceptance was rare, and fiction continued to be regarded with skepticism. In the mid-Meiji period, the literary reformer and realism proselytizer Tsubo Shoyo sought to rescue the Shosetsu from this low status and the ill repute by linking it to the newly f imported Western novel, which he saw as the sole medium capable of portraying the social and psychological truths of modern life. His efforts proved effective and the term came to designate high art prose fiction of any length. 
This elevation in meaning and status gave the show sets of a newfound seriousness and bourgeois respectability. It is precisely this shoyo-esque notion of the show sets that Ishikawa would seek to overturn several decades later. The second term central to our discussion is mimesis, derived from the Greek words mimesthai and mimos, uh, to imitate and mime or imitator respectively. Mimesis is the idea that art is the copy or reflection of some pre-existing reality. In literature, it presupposes that language is capable of representing reality. The ancient Greeks were the first to develop a systematic theory of mimesis. In his Republic, written around 380 BC, Plato defined mimesis as a basic human instinct and the foundation of all representational arts and discourse, and famously banished poetry and tragedy from his ideal republic on the grounds that they were mere shadows or simulations of the phenomenal world, which itself was a mere copy of ultimate or ideal reality, the eternal realm of universal forms. His pupil Aristotle defended mimes mimetic art in his Poetics, written around 335 BC, arguing that it was more than the slavish imitation of existing life, that it was also instructive, morally edifying, reflective of our desire for harmony and unity, and involved imaginative creation of possible realities. He developed a theory of mimetic drama consisting of six parts, plot, character, diction, thought, spectacle, and rhythmical, rhythmic language, that together produce a catharsis or purgation of pity and fear in the audience. Three centuries later, the Roman historian and poet Horace, in his Ars Poetica, written around, uh, written in 19 BC, praised the ways the ancient Greek masters employed mimesis. Shortly after that, Longinus, 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 writing in the first century A.D., refined, redefined mimesis in his On the Sublime, as a set of creative processes that he called the sublime imagination. In the modern period, many leading Western philosophers and literary critics, including Martin Heidegger, Eric Auerbach, Jacques Derrida, Gerard René, Roland Barthes, Barthes René Gerard, Stephen Halliwell, Halliwell Hans George Gadamer, Paul Ricoeur, and Richard Rorty, have written extensively on the subject. While all of their theories and terminologies have been helpful, I have refrained from re relying on any of them in my study, opting instead to use my own, admittedly simpler, conception of me mimetic realism, the pro product of both my close readings of Ishikawa's works and my extensive readings in East Asian and Western literature. <clears throat> I define a work as realist, not when it corresponds to some external reality or observable phenomena, but rather when it displays low levels of the four types of literary mediation, deep, surface, reflexive, and figural, outlined above. <clears throat> In its broadest sense, mimesis is the faculty that makes possible most human activities, the mechanism by which human subjectivity is formed, and the basis of all representational arts. While all living organisms utilize mimesis to varying degrees, humans are the mimetic animal par excellence, homo mimeticus ergo homo sapien. Nearly all aspects of human life, language ac acquisition, social interaction, musical education, religious ritual, erotic relationships, athletic training, all forms of artistic representation, are shaped by the imitation of models. Christianity is a fundamentally mimetic religion with its three-tier hierarchical structure that urges emulation of Christ the Son, who emulates God the Father. Buddhism is mimetic inasmuch as it regards the enlightened mind as a reality reflecting mirror and encourages imitation of the fourth noble truth, the eight practices, as the means for attaining liberation from ninne or samsara, suffering and rebirth. Mimetic processes can be observed in children imitating their older siblings, giving rise to sibling rivalry, humans build machines that mimic human activities, which in turn become models for human emulation. Classical virtue ethics, whether pagan, Christian, Buddhist, or Confucian, involve the imitation of ideal models. All languages have mimetic words that imitate sounds or phenomena. Japanese abounds in such words, known as Gisego and Kitaigo, 
Japan's project of modernization was driven by a desire to avoid colonization by imitating the technologically superior West. The first Chinese characters invented over three millennia ago were mimetic pictograms carved on oracle bones known as Jia Gu Wen, oracle bone script. Pre-modern works of art involve imitation in a double sense of representing both immediately observable phenomena, primary mimesis, and preceding works of art, secondary mimesis. The very structure of human desire is mimetic, as René Girard famously showed. Even at the neuronal level, mimesis is at work. The human brain will fire certain neurons not only when, it's performing, when performing a specific action, but also when observing that action being performed by another individual, a phenomenon known as mirror neurons. Given this centrality of mimesis to human experience and artistic representation, it would be absurd to claim that Ishkal opposed the notion and practice of mimesis in and of itself. This book argues instead that his critique was directed at a specific type of mimetic representation that emerged in the early Meiji period and quickly became the de facto mode of Japanese literature. As outlined in the introduction, this new type of mimesis has four defining features. First, it is grounded in a mimet mechanistic picture of reality that draws sharp distinctions between subject and object, artist and world, interiority and exteriority. Second, it overwhelmingly pri privileges primary mimesis over secondary mimesis. Third, it regards art as subordinate to reality, which stands over and above the various accounts of it. Fourth, it posits language as a transparent medium that is capable of conveying reality, an idea that philosophers sometimes call correspondence theory. This theory is closely related to another key term in this book, mimetic criticism, a mode of reading that interprets and evaluates a work of art in relation to its proximity to truth or reality. In Japan, this mode of reading has dominated since the early Meiji period when it displaced long-standing traditional hermeneutic frameworks. Crucially, realism denotes both a set of creative methods and a mode of reading. And this mode of reading views the work of art in direct relation to the reality that is purported to represent and holds semblance to reality as the primary criterion for evaluating works of art. This duality is especially significant in the context of this book, which employs the term in both senses. Iskawa critiques this dominant mode of reading in his critical essays, most trenchantly in On the Thought Patterns of the People of Edo, which I discuss in Chapter 7, while pointing toward more analogical, allegorical, and symbolical, symbolic ways of interpreting text and world. During the war years, Ishika looked back at the first six decades of modern Japanese literary history and saw the inexorable unfolding of the decision made in the early Meiji years to adopt Shajitsugi as the primary modus operandi and chief aesthetic paradigm. Whereas tr traditional Japanese writers and artists tended to interpret and depict the world analogically, through the mediating prism of pre-existing literary and religious texts and works of art, modern Japanese writers, initially at least, sought to depict the world from an allegedly neutral or objective perspective, a perspective that is no perspective at all, as philosopher and literary theorist Hans George Gadamer succinctly put it. The new literary hermeneutic paradigm posited the artist as a detached observer who stood apart from both the observed social world and past literary traditions. For Ishikawa, this shift in aesthetics could only lead to the impoverishment of art, the erosion of a shared cultural community, and the diminution of literary imagination. In response, he sought alternative creative modes that actively engage with past traditions, that view artist and world as constitutively linked, and that confer equal value to both primary and secondary mimesis. Between 1937 and 1945, Ishikawa famously turned to the literature of the Edo period, specifically the hasoho, or thought modes, or literary methods and reading practices of haikai literature. In Chapter 7, I explore the features and methods of this haikai imagination, to borrow scholar Haruo Shirane's apt phrase, and Ishikawa's response to them. Ishikawa was attracted to haikai literature because it offered an alternative set of practices creative practices and methods that perceives the world analogically, 
viewing every lowly or common phenomenon as correlating to some higher or sacred phenomenon, and vice versa. In short, the Haikai imagination resonated with his own view that life and art cannot be severed from each other. His position on the interrelation between life and art is not unlike that of Oscar Wilde, who in 1889, his 1889 essay, The Decay of Lying, famously quipped, life imitates art far more than art imitates life. The third term, realism, is the product and heir of the classical notion of mimesis. In the West, literary realism is generally associated with the works of 19th century European and North American authors such as Honoré de Balzac, Fyodor Dostoevsky, Leo Tolstoy, Gustave Flaubert, Ivan Turgenev, Jane Austen, Henry James, and Henri Henrik Ibsen. Henrik Ibsen. These writers probed the dark complexities of modern society and human psychology and the effects of economic relations on human behavior using straightforward language and recurring characters. It is, of course, impossible to determine the precise extent to which a work is realistic, since neither language nor perception nor reason can ever capture the whole of reality. Moreover, what may seem natural or real in one historical setting may seem fantastical or unreal in another, and vice versa. And as I said before, I, yes, do my mind, that's a repetition there, we we'll skip that. Prior to the Meiji period, the notion of realism in the sense of exclusive reliance on primary representation was largely alien to the Japanese. Okay, so underline this, uh, to make note of this term, this distinction uh, between the two types of mimesis that I uh, employ throughout this book, primary mimesis and secondary mimesis. The fourth key term, naturalism, Shizen Shugi in Japanese, is a central aesthetic category in standard histories of modern Japanese literature. Shizen, or in Chinese, Zireng, originally meant something like spontaneous, in itself, a proceeding of its own accord. In the late 1880s, the word came to serve as the translation for the German word Natur. Shizen Shugi thus literally means the system of Natur, or Shizen. It is a notoriously unwieldy concept that can denote at least four distinct phenomena, depending on context. First, it can signify the set of deterministic scientific discourses and social theories that emerged in Europe between the 17th and 19th centuries that supplanted earlier metaphysics and aesthetics as the dominant world picture, or Weltbild. Build. These discourses and theories conceived of the natural world as a set of me mechanistic laws and processes using rational observation to predict and model and master and record and observe and manipulate and uncover the reality. I need to fix that sentence. Second, the term refers to the literary and artistic movements of Europe and North America that arose out of these new scientific theories in juxtaposition to the excesses of Romanticism that had preceded them. Third, used in the context of modern Japanese literature, it denotes the so-called Zenki Shizen Shugi, or early naturalism phase, that dominated the Japanese literary world from the 1890s to around 1910, and that drew from the works of Emile Zola and other European naturalists. And fourth, it denotes the so-called Koki Shizen Shugi, or late naturalism phase that began in the late Meiji and covers the rise of the Watakushi Shosetsu, or I novel. Literary naturalism is usually said to have begun with the writings of the French novelist and playwright Emile Zola. In polemical essays such as Le Roman Experimental, the experimental novel 1880, and Naturalism on the Stage, and novels such as Therese Raquin, Zola put forth a quasi-scientific view of literature that posited the writer as a doctor or clinical pathologist whose job was to observe and analyze life by submitting it to uni universal laws. By extension, he viewed the novel as a vehicle for conducting such experiments, depicting the negative consequences of human sexuality in bourgeois society and the relationship between nature and the social environment. As he put it, the writer gives the facts as he has observed them, suggests the point of departure, displays the solid earth on which his characters are to tread and the phenomena to develop. I have footnotes in here um, to give the sources for all of this information I'm giving now, so you have to wait till the book comes out to read, uh, to go th sift through the um, sources.
<coughs> the first I skipped this phenomena to develop. He called this two, new type of novel Le Nouvelle Formule, Formule, which he expressed in three core principles Faire vrai, make it true, faire grand, make it grand, and faire simple, make it simple. The first exhorts writers to create lifelike settings and characters that adhere to the laws of psychology, environment, and hereditary, heredity. The second urges writers to make the conflicts profound and philosophical in scope, and the third urges them to construct plots that are logical and simply presented. Le Roman Experimental, which draws from the French Dr. Claude Bernard's Introduction to the Study of Experimental Medicine, 1865, argues that the novelist is at once an observer and experimenter who applies scientific truth to the social sphere. As he puts it, the experimenter appears and introduces an experiment, that is to say, sets his characters going in a certain story so as to show that the succession of facts will be such as the requirements of the phenomena under examination call for, end quote. In the 1880s, a wave of Zola translations, starting with those by Kosugi Tengai, began to appear in Japan, initiating the Zenki Shizen Shugi, or early naturalism phase. Given the slipperiness of the terms naturalism and shizen shugi, in this book I use the more precise and delimited terms shizen and mimetic realism, which better reflect the crucial distinctions between primary and secondary mimesis and also mimetic equivalence and analogical relation. That sentence needs some reworking. I shall return to the subjects of early naturalism and late naturalism below. While Iska recognizes the profound influence that European naturalism in both its scientific and literary senses had on Meiji writers, he traces the v roots of modern Japanese literature to two older sources that are often overlooked in standard literary histories. The first hidden source is the classical mimetic dictum, Art is the Imitation of Life, which he renders Geijutsu wa Jinsei no Moho. This conception of art, which reached Japan in the early 1880s, formed the central thrust of Tsubotsu Shoyo's Shousetsu Shinzi, The Essence of a Novel, 1885-1886, and was subsequently taken up by a generation of literary reformers. By the 1910s, virtually all writers had accepted as an a priori given that the principal goal of art was to mirror reality, whether conceived as interior or exterior phenomenon. Ishikawa's view that modern Japanese literature had its roots in this dictum, classical dictum, may seem odd or counterintuitive, given that Western aesthetics did not reach Japan to the Meiji period, I need to rework that sentence, but history shows that this realist position rises to prominence whenever a non-Western nation embarks upon the project of modernization and adopts the West's modern techno-scientific world picture. This process inevitably seems to lead to the privileging of mim primary mimesis and the deprivileging of poesis and secondary mimesis. In Meiji Japan, this logic can be seen in the emergence of the new aesthetic categories of shase, sketching from life, shajitsu, copying the actual, genjitsugi, realism, shashin, copying truth, and by extension, photography, became the word for photography, mosha, copying, mohan, emulation, and so forth. In his 1940 essay, What Constitutes a Town Ben Shosetsu, Ishika gives an uncharacteristically straightforward explanation of his view, writing, It all started long ago, when some Greek philosopher issued the famous maxim, Art is the imitation of life. This remark soon became accepted as a natural and timeless truth, a mantra that remains deeply entrenched today. The Town Ben Shosetsu, has been doggedly trudging down this path laid out by this maxim ever since its emergence as a form. Contours are now be even experimenting with a kind of inverted imitation, hantai mohang, acting out in real life their own fabrications. Just open up any textbook on the subject of art and you will find the same thing, a pyramid structure with this umbrella generic concept called art gejitsu, sitting at the apex, under which are included all the various species of sub-concept items. Literature, of course, is one of them. In its early evolutionary stages, the Shosetsu too belong to this genealogy as one of the branches 
of the subspecies called bungak or literature. But in recent years, the shosets has begun to grow in an unexpected and unforeseen way, suggesting that a fundamental shift has started to take place within its very concept, to the point that it is now clearly no longer content with having its official title conferred upon it from its former master sovereign literature. Does this rift bespeak a confrontation between the two species subconcepts of the Shosetsu and Bungaku, or is the Shosetsu having at last defected from the fusty old genealogy of art, Geijutsu, now firmly set upon establishing itself as an autonomous sui generis concept? Though I shall leave aside such questions for now, I will note that it does seem reasonable to keep these to keep the two types of tampen under the rubric of literature, given that even today their practitioners still aspire to the lofty status of art. And indeed, those writers who piously contrive to portray a slice of life in 50 pages should not hesitate when calling themselves artists. Just know that once the discussion has degenerated to this point, their works no longer have anything to do with the show sets of proper, and that in itself is a great burden lifted from my mind. End quote. The second hidden or buried source that formed the basis of modern Japanese liter realist f fiction, according to Ishika, is the Ninjobon, the sentimental novellas that emerged in the early 19th century and lasted well into the early Meiji. This genre of melodramatic fiction was extremely popular in the 19th century, mostly among female readers. Its most famous practitioner was Tamenaga Shinsei, whose masterpiece Shunshoku Ume Goyomi Intimations of Spring, the Plum Calendar, 1832-1833, is regarded as the genre's paradigmatic work. Like the Sharebon, the Ninjobon dealt with contemporary life in the pleasure quarters of Edo, but with the focus on the love affairs and emotional entanglements of its denizens. Ishika saw this major prose genre as not only the sole surviving literary relic from the Edo period, but also the prototype for the modern shosetsu, which he regards as inauthentic shosetsu and demotes to the status of novels. Nouvelles. He explains his view on this matter in what constitutes a tampen shosetsu, which I discuss in chapter 6. The classical mimetic dictum, which seem, deems art's role to be the imitation of reality, sounds simple enough. But problems arise the moment we start to examine its, its three constitutive terms, art, imitation, and reality. The first term, art, is hardly self-explanatory. Notions of art are historically contingent and mutate over time. What is regarded by one culture or epoch as legitimate art might not be regarded as such in another. The second term, imitation, is equally problematic. Of the major artistic forms, poetry, painting, sculpture, dance, drama, photography, and music, it is not clear which is best suited for faithful imitation. Photography may capture the outward forms of observable phenomena, but there is certainly more to reality than edos, aspects, facades, and appearances. The third term, reality, is the most elusive and equivocal. Conceptions of reality differ from person to person, culture to culture, epoch to epoch. What may seem natural or real to pre-moderns may seem wholly unnatural and unreal to moderns and vice versa. Philosophers throughout history have disagreed on the fundamental nature of reality. For Plato, reality meant the eternal and unchanging realm of forms. For Aristotle, reality was a category that referred to the basic constituent substance of the physical world in which actual and eternal were conjoined. Two millennia later, Immanuel Kant drew a sharp distinction between knowable appearances, mental re representations of the external world, and unknowable reality, which he called the Dang Ang Sik, or the thing in itself, i.e. what lies beyond the limits of perception or human reason. For Hegel, reality was the unfolding progression of objective spirit or geist in time as it moves inexorably toward its final realization. In the early 20th century, Martin Heidegger imagined reality as the history of the intermittent revelation and concealment of being, sein, Freudian psychoanalyst and theorist Jacques Lacan defined the real as that which defies signification or symbolization. In recent years, literary critic and theorist Frederick Jameson has defined reality as nothing less than the totality of history. <laughs> 
and then we have a sentence that I omitted, but I will read it here. Without some universal consensus regarding the content and substance of the real, the concept of realism will remain forever remain ambiguous and elusive. The aesthetic traditions of East Asia generally conceive reality as something inextricably, inextricably bound up with human experience, cultural traditions, and symbolically charged language. This fundamentally humanistic or anthropocentric orientation is reflected in the fifth key term of this book, Hong Yi, or Bang Yi, Bang Yi in Chinese, written with the graphs Hong or original, basic, and Yi, meaning intent. Hong Yi is a core concept in traditional East Asian poetry and art, often translated as established meanings or poetic essences. The term expresses not the objective attributes of a natural phenomenon, but rather the conventional connotations and subjective associations that have accrued around it over time through repeated use by poets and artists. Prior to the Meiji period, Japanese writers and artists made no sharp distinction between primary and secondary mimesis. They were concerned less with reality as such than with its acculturated manifestations as interpreted by humans. Any representation of a natural phenomenon necessarily entailed the representation of previous poems, stories, events, characters, and linguistic conventions and associations with which the audience was familiar. These associations often came from classical sources, Shinto beliefs, imperial court rituals, Chinese and Japanese poetic tropes, ancient Chinese philosophical principles codified in the Heian period, many of which were passed down through medieval no drama, Nenga linked verse, and later haikai poetry. In waka poetry, for example, the hong yi of a dai, or set topic, emphasized inherited meanings over objective attributes. Harusame, spring rain, suggested falling rain. Gentle falling rain, koi, erotic love, implied unfulfilled longing, tabi, or travel, connoted the melancholy of being far from the capital, hana, or blossoms, were associated with spring, tsuki, or moon, evoked autumn and its attendant associations, and so forth. I might delete that sentence right there. This emphasis on conventional meanings and associations is a c crucial distinction between traditional Japanese literature and modern realism. If Western realism seeks to trace the outward appearance, appearance of natural or social phenomena, traditional Japanese poetry aimed to convey the subjective or poetic essence of a thing through adaptation, parody, and intertextual connections. As Earl Miner aptly put it, traditional Japanese literature is based not on the imitation of discrete agencies, but on relation, by which he meant the relation between contemporary lived reality and precursor texts. The evocation of a thing's poetic or subjective essence, the hoi, is at least as important as the simulation of its objective reality. The truth of a phenomenon is to be found not in its surface appearance, but rather in its hong yi. By reviving this forgotten conception of mimesis, which assigns equal importance to primary and secondary mimesis, Ishika sought to overcome the impasse that modern Japanese literature found itself in. It has long been commonplace to assert that the East Asian aesthetic traditions lack any concept analogous to Western realism. Prominent literary critic turned philosopher Karatani Kojin, for example, for instance, declared in a 1985 lecture on pre-Meiji Japanese literature that in the East, the word realism as the representation of reality does not exist. His remark echoes a claim made almost a century earlier by influential scholar Okakura Tenshin in his lecture Nature in East Asian Painting that the Eastern artist tried to take from nature what was essential. He did not take in all the details, but chose what he thought the most important. His work was therefore an essay on nature instead of an imitation of nature." End quote. Some scholars have attributed this apparent lack of any concept or category analogous to realism to the general skepticism in East Asia toward dualistic modes of thinking. Sakabe Megumi, for instance, remarks that, quote, nothing is more alien to Japanese th thought than Cartesian dualism. He claims that such dualistic thinking, he continues, that such dualistic thinking, which draws a sharp division between subject and object, is a precondition of any system of mimetic realism, that realism never took hold 
because East Asian traditions are non-dualistic, I will erase that sentence there, ignore that. But this popular view makes sense only if we ex excise from our conception of mimesis the imitation of Hong Yi, which is perhaps the higher, highest order of aesthetic imitation, especially in East Asia. In recent years, scholars have begun to challenge this long-standing view that mimesis is the exclusive property of the West and that East Asian traditions are essentially expressionistic, lyricistic, and non-mimetic. In his 2005 article, Is Mimetic Theory in Literature and Art Universal? The scholar Ming Dong Gu argues that East Asian traditions are in fact mimetic, but in a more expansive sense. He writes, True, I quote, True, the Chinese idea of mimesis is different from its Western counterpart, but the difference is a matter of degree, not kind. I argue that all the essential cultural determinants for the rise of mimetic theory exist in the Chinese tradition, and that the accepted contrast between Western mimesis and the Chinese lack, lack of it is a misconception that grew out of a preconceived notion about the differences between the respective cultures. Methodologically, it has resulted from a narrow view of some conceptual underpinnings of mimetic theory and an insufficient attention to mimetic insights in the mainstream as well as the undercurrents of traditional Chinese thought." End quote. <clears throat> Gu concludes that traditional Chinese art and poetry are mimetic, only in a platonic rather than Aristotelian sense. Though it lies beyond the scope of this book to explore these broader questions about the nature and development of mimetic notions in East Asian literature, I begin from the premise that Chinese and Japanese traditions are indeed, in a sense, mimetic, both primary and secondary. Japan's long-standing traditional aesthetic orientation, which draws no sharp distinction between primary and secondary mimesis, began to erode in the early Meiji period as the country embarked on its project of civilization and enlightenment, Bumekaika. Within the span of a few decades, the country had overhauled its political and social institutions, transforming itself from a semi-isolated feudal state into a modern nation state with a centralized government, rebranded monarchy, financial system, booming industry, a conscript army and police force, and a justice system, all based on Western models. Eager to establish an official state religion in the manner of Western nations, Japan recast its ancient Shinto myths in, into a state ideology known as Kokka Shinto, or National Shinto, while relegating foreign-derived Buddhism to the margins through a policy known as Haibutsu Kishaku, or abolish Buddhism and destroy Shakamuni. In the cultural sphere, writers and artists turned away from traditional frameworks that valued pastiche, parody, intertextuality, and illusion, replacing these with a new aesthetic paradigm that privileged the terms I outlined above, shase, shajitsu, genjitsu, shashin, mosha, and mohang. For Ishikawa, this reorientation in aesthetic sensibility had a deleterious effect on the traditional modes of seeing and creating that had long been central to the Japanese experience. His early writings are an attempt to reveal the implications and perils or hazards of this shift to liberate writing from the new shajitsugi logic, to recover past modes of thinking and creating, and to forge a new type of prose that is poetic rather than mimetic in character, and whose highest form is the shosetsu, the privileged signifier in his early writings. In short, Shadjitsugi realism as both a set of creative methods and an interpretive mode was something radically new to the Japanese of the early Meiji period. While traditional forms of mimetic representation had existed in previous forms of visual arts and drama, they differed from the new shajitsu derived concepts. Even the traditional concepts that came closest to Western mimesis, shase, sketching from life, monomane, imitative acting, keiji, or in Chinese, xingzi, xingzi, descriptive likeness of form, the third of the six principles of Chinese painting, and modoki, parodic reenactment or mimicry, diverge in both their objects and modes of imitation. If Western mimesis aims to simulate or repl replicate the contours and appearances of the world, traditional chasse sought to sketch physical landscapes through intensely subjective observation, Monomane involved imitation of an artist's, of an object's distilled essence in a highly formalized way, as seen in medieval Yamato Sadugaku, 
mon monkey music and no traditional dramas, tradi drama traditions. And kabuki employed highly stylized symbolic gestures rather than true to life mimicry to convey the subjective character or hongi of a thing, person, or event. Traditional Japanese poetry, as I discussed in chapter 7, gave priority to techniques of appropriative sampling and parody such as honkadori, elusive variation in waka, and honshidori, elusive variation of shi, shi, shi or Chinese poetry, privileg privileging shai, imaginative representation, over purely mimetic techniques such as shajitsu and keiji. Famously, Japan's greatest jōruri dramatist, Chikamatsu Monzaimon, uh, who lived in the late 17th century, early 18th century, spurned the idea of pure realism in art on the grounds that it would permit no pleasure in the work. He used the term jijitsu, jijitsu, uh, sorry, jitsuji, to express this insipid kind of realism, no noting that, quote, if one makes an exact exact copy of a living being, even if it happened to be yang guifei, one will become disgusted with it, end quote. He urged artists to pursue instead the slender margin between the real and the unreal. End quote. In an often cited passage, he explained, quote, In writing Jōruri, one attempts first to describe facts as they really are, but in doing, one writes things which are not true, in the interest of art. In recent plays, many things have been said by female characters which women could not utter. Such things fall under the heading of art. It is because they say what could not come from a real woman's lips that their true emotions are disclosed. If in such cases the author were to model his character on the ways of a real woman and conceal her feelings, such realism, far from being admired, would permit no pleasure in the work." End quote. Quote is from uh, translation is by Keane too. I should note that all my all the most ninety percent of the translations that appear in this tome are by me, and I um, specify when it's uh, when somebody else did the translation. End quote. In marked contrast to this traditional negative understanding of realism, modern shajitsugi seeks to uh, to co copy actuality shajitsu while actively suppressing secondary mimesis in the four types of mediation, deep, surface, reflexive, and figural. All right, we've got to take a break before I pass out. All right, next section. The first three phases of realism. New novels inspired by Shoyo's treatise, new novels, Shin Shousetsu, early naturalism, and late naturalism, or the eye novel. Standard literary histories often situate mainstream modern Japanese literature within the rubric of naturalism, Shizen Shugi. Donald Keane noted the privileged status of this mode when he remarked, if any movement in Japanese literature of the 20th century can be described as central, it is doubtlessly naturalism, Shizen Shugi, by which he no doubt meant what I am calling Shajitsu Shugi. This mainstream mode unfolded in three initial phases, early realist experiments, early naturalism, or Zenki Shizen Shugi, and late naturalism, Koki Shizen Shugi. The first phase featured the initial experiments in literary realism that followed, or were inspired by, the publication of the first section of Tsubo Shoyo's serialized essay, The Essence of a Novel, in 1885 many of which were political novels, seiji shōsetsu, that dealt with recent political issues and themes. The second phase covers the Zola-inspired social realist novels that appeared in the second half of the Meiji period. The third phase refers to the emergence in the late Meiji of the Watakushi shōsetsu, or Ai novel, which eventually became the preeminent genre of prose writing. As these three initial stages form the back drop of Ishikawa's critical essays, I shall develop them in the following pages. Despite their significant differences, the phases are alike in that they are each equally committed to the notion of mimetic realism and its attendant belief that reality can be object objectively observed and described from a neutral standpoint using putatively transparent language. <laughs> 
It is precisely this naive conception of language and reality that Ishikawa sought to both complexify and deconstruct in his early writings. Japanese literary realism is often said to have begun with the publication of Tsubochi Shoyo's treatise, The Essence of a Novel, which marked the first attempt to develop a coherent theory of the realistic new novel, Shin Shosetsu, and introduced the modern realist novel to Japan. Although the extent of its influence has long been a matter of dispute, the treatise most certainly had a deep and lasting impact on the evolution of modern Japanese literature. Shoyo took his pen name from the Chinese term Xiaoyao, which means free roaming or wandering, he was the quintessential Meiji Enlightenment personage, novelist, critic, scholar of English literature, translator of Shakespeare, and proselytizer and theorist of modern realism. In his treatise, he argued that the modern writer should seek to depict contemporary life as it existed, sonomama and arinomama are use, words he uses, by deploying the methods and techniques of naturalistic realism, which he rendered variously as mohang, model, Shajitsu, copy and actuality, shase, sketching from life, and mosha. By life, he meant three things, ninjo, human passions, setai, social conditions, and fuzoka, behaviors or customs. As he famously stated in the opening to chapter three of the treatise, quote, the proper subjects, shugang, of the novel is human passions, ninjo, close behind follow society, setai, and customs, fuzoka. Crucially, his tripartite conception of reality excludes the realm of precursor literary texts, stories, poems, tropes, and myths, which Ishka views as a fundamentally constitutive part of reality. To achieve the faithful representation of his triadic reality, of this triadic reality, Shoyo urged young writers to emulate recent British and European novels which he believed exemplified classical virtues of symmetry, heterogeneity, coherence of plot, emulation, and originality. He criticized Edo period writers such as Kyokute, Takizawa, Baking of the late Edo period, second half of the Edo period, Taminaga Shunsei, and Santo Kyoden for their tendency to rely on illustrations, melodrama, frivolity, and Confucian didacticism, embodying the phrase Kanzen Chowaku, promote good and punish evil. He denounced their penchant for pornography and violence, improbable plots, lengthy exposition, ex escapism, lack of objectivity, favoritism towards certain characters, fondness for ostent ostentatious scholarship, rhetorical flourishes, and lack of dramatic sense. But he was most critical of their preference for art referentiality, what I'm calling secondary mimesis, over imme immediate life referentiality, what I'm calling primary mimesis. That is, their tendency to borrow material from previous works rather than draw directly from contemporary life and create something original. While Shoyo's ideas soon caught on, traditional features die hard, and modern Japanese fiction retain core features of earlier narrative forms such as Gesaku and Yomi Hong. The political novels of the early Meiji period, for example, rely heavily on surviving narrative conventions and form. Not to mention the Ninjo Bon, which Ishikawa correctly saw to be one of the two foundations upon which the modern pseudo Shosetsu was built. Today, it is not hard to find the implicit biases and prejudices in Shoyo's treatise. He often misreads aspects of the Japanese literary tradition due to his adherence to the idea that Shajitsugi is the sole literary mode suited to the modern age. In his discussion of Japanese poetry, for instance, he states that. Well, our tanka and choka, by comparison with Western poetry, are very simple. They do, not, they do no more than express a transient emotion, end quote. Instead of reading Japan, classical Japanese poetry as it had always been read, as a series of poems linked by subtle shifts in linguistic associations, he reads it as if it were English poetry, locating meaning in the individual unit rather than in the poetic sequence and the relation to the larger tradition. Crucially, his trifurcation of reality into ninjo, setai, fuzoka excises essential aspects of reality, thus preventing a deeper understanding of reality's connections with myths of the past, inherited culture associations, tropes, and symbolic valences. He privileges objective external appearances over poetic essences or hoi, mimetic certainty and putatively immediate experience over mediation and traditional conventions and practices. As the scholar Watanabe Kazuyasu aptly put it, 
quote, At the core of Shoyo's realist views of literature, Shadishugi, lies a naive externalism. He definitely lacked awareness of a cognitive subject. Shoyo could not think of an object that is sustained by the subject. So long as he defended such a position, beauty depended on the object, and thus he could not grasp the internal principles inherent in beauty. This also explains why, in the end, essence of the novel, his treatise, did not lead to the creation of any literature with the exception of the works of the Kang Yusha group. All right, the last claim that he makes is debatable, I think. Uh, his, influential, his influence is um, a matter of fact, I think, if you look at uh, his Japanese literary history as developed after that essay, but uh, that's... Uh, not my main point here. Okay, next paragraph. It is worth noting here that the rise of realism in Japan would not have been possible without the coterminous rise of the vernacular style known as Genbun Ichi, the standard written language of modern Japan. Written with the characters Gen, speech, plus Bun, writing, plus Ichi, unification, this style emerged in the 1880s, shortly after Japan came into broad contact with Western literature, rhetoric, and philosophy. It first spread in the government, then spilled over into public schools, and by late Meiji had overtaken the literary world. The work, usually cited as the first full realization of the styles Futabate Shime's Ukigumo, Floating Clouds, 1887-1889, which critiques the materialist ethos of Meiji society and the unraveling of the social fabric. Shime's translation of Russian writer Ivan Turgenev's Svidani, the Rendezvous, um, and as Ibiki, and Trizvitschi, Chance Meetings, as Meguriai. The claim that uh, this is a claim that Ishikawa would implicitly deny on the grounds that such novels are not true shosetsu, but rather, I, I gotta erase that sentence right there. There was a brief return in the early 1890s to previous styles in the literary world. But this ended with the anti-Chinese sentiment, sentiment that arose during the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894-1895. As Nanette Twine notes, and she's the author of one of the major uh, essays on uh, the development of Genbun Ichi in Japan, uh, she notes, quote, By 1887, the idea of using Genbun Ichi as a means of spreading education and reaching all Japanese was firmly implanted and had to and had, to a considerable extent, won out against traditional prejudices. By the turn of the century, Genbunichi had displaced the earlier traditional prose styles, such as classical prose, bungo, gabung, wabung, those are all ways of uh, referring to the classical prose style, elegant and colloquial hybrid style, or the gazokusetsu tai, as it's known, kanbung, was also displaced, synetic prose, formal epistolary style, the sorobum, and pseudo-classical style, or Gikobun. By 1913, it had become so widespread that all the Genbunichi style had become so widespread that all school textbooks, newspapers, journals, and magazines were being written in the new vernacular. By late Meiji, all novelists had adopted the style, and it was now so ubiquitous that the term Genbunichi was no longer used. Ishikawa was, of course, and in the footnote there I provide all the uh, further reading about the Genbunichi if you're interested. Uh, Ishikawa was, of course, not the only writer to challenge the Genbunichi. The style encountered its first round of critics almost immediately after it first appeared. In the late 1880s, prominent Ken Yusha school writers such as Ozaki Koyo and Izumi Kyoka began developing a self-consciously literary style that harkened back to Edo period writers including Ihara Saikaku, Ryute Tanehiko and Taminaga Shinsei. During the Taisho years, modernists such as Tainzaki Junichiro, Nagai Kafu, and Akutaga Ryunosuke began to experiment with a variety of dialects and narrative styles in the hope of expanding literary writing beyond Genbun Ichi. Ishikawa belonged to the next generation of Genbun Ichi skeptics who rejected the idea that speech, or gen, and writing, bun, could be unified, Ichi, into a single style. As he puts it in form and content in writing, his essay that I discussed, chapter 5, I think, writing is, quote, never s a simple graphic snapshot of speech, end quote, but instead a semi-autonomous system with its own internal logic and rhythms that are extraneous to speech, which is why the mere transcription of speech can never result in authentic writing. 
sort of a paraphrase of one of his main points in that essay. By the time Ishkar wrote his debut work, Kajing, The Fair One, in 1935, which I discussed in chapter three of this book, and I provide the translation, my translation in the second half of the book, uh, the style, by, by 1935, the style had long been the de facto standard mode for prose writing, and previous styles had largely died out. Indeed, the shift from traditional styles to Genbun Ichi was so profound that today most Japanese struggle to read works written before 1905, a phenomenon I just observe each time I teach works such as Koda Rohan's Taidokuro, Encounter with a Skull, 1890, or Moriogai's The Dancing Girl. By the late Meiji, any return to antecedent styles was out of the question, and it was against this backdrop that Ishikawa raised his voice of dissent. The second phase of Japanese realism, early naturalism, or Zenki Shizen Shugi, developed in the late 1880s following the influx of translations of works by Emil Zola and his descendants, including Guy de Maupassant, Henrik Ibsen, Theodore Dreiser, Maxim Gorky, and Anton Chekhov. A new generation of Japanese writers, most notably Hasegawa Tenke, Takayama Chogyo, Katagami Tengen, Kosugi Tengai, Nagai Kafu, and Soma Gyofu, modeling their works on these European naturalist antecedents, explored the dark side of Meiji civilization and enlightenment, writing character-centered stories that probed the deterministic social effects of environment, birth, and class, using straightforward language and placing their characters in environments that would yield certain results. Like realism's first phase, this phase was rooted in the conviction that the primary of art and literature is to imitate reality. But whereas first phase realism conce conceived objective reality in terms of shoyo's ninjo setai fuzoku triad, early naturalists placed emphasis on shoyo's second category, setai, social conditions. As Hasegawa Tenke famously put it, the novel's chief duty was to expose the raw truth, genjitsu bakuro by which he meant the unflinching depiction of social ills and uglier aspects of modern life. The third phase of realism, late naturalism, or kokishizen shugi, covers the literary prose genre known as the watakushi shosetsu, or eye novel. Although critical discourse about the eye novel did not emerge until the 1920s, as uh, Tomi Suzuki right, explains in her books, the term the term watakushi shosetsu is said to have been coined by Uno Koji in his 1920 story, Amaki Yo no Hanashi, Story of a Sweet World. And as I know in the footnote, there are several other um, explanations about when the, first, the term first emerged. So although the discourse came later, the genre is usually said to have be emerged in 1907 with the publication of Tayama Katai's Futon, The Quilt, and to have winded down around 1920. The reality is, however, that the eye novel has endured through the subsequent decades and still survives today as a major mode of fiction writing. Typically defined as an autobiographical or semi-autographical genre that purports to depict the immediate sensory experiences and thoughts of its author in a transparent Genpun Ichi style, the eye novel is marked by a deliberate blurring of fiction and fact, a privileging of subjectivity over objective depiction, and a focus on the personal and self-revelation. It is sometimes divided into two types, the Kokohaku Shosetsu, or confessional novel, and the Shinkyo Shosetsu, or mental state novel. The former is sometimes called its self-destructive model, Hametsu Gata, since the author-narrator's confessions usually involve lurid details about their dissolute life and immorality. Notable practitioners of this type include Kasai Zenso, Zenzo, Masamune Hakucho, Iwana Hōme, Kamura Isota, and Uno Koji. The latter type is sometimes called the Harmony no mo Model, Chowagata, due to its focus on the earnest probing of inner thoughts about everyday life, affirmation, conformity, self-cultivation, self-exploration, and abstract expression. This type is often associated with traditional literary forms such as the Zihitsu essay, Waka poetry, and diary literature, Nikki Bungaku, the works of Shiga Naoya, Ami no Kiku, Taki Kousaku, those are his uh, deshi, Shiga Naoya's deshi, as well as Ozaki Kazuo, Shimaki Kensaku, and Kaji Motojiro are often cited as examples of this second type. The idea that the eye novel constitutes a discrete literary genre has been challenged in recent years most forcefully by the scholar Tomi Suzuki. In her 
influential 1996 book narrating the self, fictions of Japanese modernity. Suzuki defines the I novel as an autobiographical narrative in which the author is sought to recount faithfully the details of his or her personal life in thin, thus, thin guise of fiction. The important word here is thought, since, as Suzuki argues, the I novel is less a discrete literary genre with fixed characteristics than a specific mode of reading, an interpretive framework, a critical discourse. Citing examples from the various I novel debates of the mid 1920s, she shows how this critical discourse was invented in the 1920s and applied retroactively to earlier works. While her argument is no doubt valid, the question of whether the I novel is a discrete literary form or a sub specific mode of reading is, to my mind, an academic quibble over terminology. Suzuki's main thesis, that modes of writing and modes of reading are distinct categories, crumbles under scrutiny. While it may be true that the I novel began as a mode of reading, writers eventually became so hypersensitive to this interpretive mode that their very awareness of it began to affect the way they would write, eventually giving rise to an entirely new genre of novel. All writers anticipate certain modes of reading when creating a work, and likewise all readers presuppose certain modes of writing when reading. Clearly, there is a deep interrelation and interpenetration between modes of reading and modes of writing. In this book, I treat the I novel as both a specific mode of reading and a discrete literary genre. Ultimately, what matters from a pragmatic standpoint is that the I novel has occupied a central role in the history of modern Japanese fiction since the late Meiji, spanning the various literary circles. The scholar Paul Anderer goes so far as to call the I novel the dominant mode of serious fiction writing since the turn of the 20th century in Japan, end quote. Though initially inspired by European models, I novelists quickly shifted the focus of their works away from unadorned depictions of modern society and toward a morbidly introspective and subjective style that placed a heavy stress on revelations of their own sordid lifestyles and sexual desires. Writers began to engage in wild and reckless behavior for the seemingly sole purpose of writing about those experiences. In his essay, What Constitutes a Tampen Shosetsu, Ishikawa describes how these experimental works sought to erase the boundary between life, boundary between art and life. So you say, between art and life, so that, quote, from Ishka, by the Taisho period, this newly forged brand of European naturalism was already beginning to exhibit hysterical symptoms as writers began to describe with increasing agitation and always in the first person the affairs and fits of their protagonists delineating the locus of responsibility so that readers would immediately understand that this watakshi, or I, and the author himself were categorically identical with the ultimate effect that such frenzied works would soon come to constitute their own independent subset of literature. As a result of this shift, Japanese literature was presented with a golden opportunity to partake in the great literary upheaval that was still transpiring in the West, thanks in large, large part to that singular invention that it had laboriously forged, namely the so-called watakshi shosetsu, or I novel. End quote. For Ishikawa, this turn inward signaled not a radical departure from the two preceding phases of shajitsugi realism, as is often claimed, but rather its logical endpoint. By redirecting the mimetic gaze onto their own private lives, I novelists had brought modern Japanese literature to an irredeemable impasse, and it was precisely this impasse that Ishikawa sought to overcome in his early fiction. As I demonstrate in Chapter 3, Ishikawa attempted to upend the I novel not by dismissing it tout court and writing in some other mode altogether, but by operating from within the genre, a strategy that I call his imminent, imminent critique. By doing so, he also seeks to overcome its chief subject the Kindai Jiga, the notion of the putatively free and autonomous modern self. Like the, two f the first two iterations of realism, the I novel remained tethered to the literary hermeneutic constellation of Shadetsugi, which draws a sharp distinction between representing subject and represented world, and regards art as the unmediated reflection of immediate reality. But whereas first phase realists defined reality in terms of shoyo's ninjo setai fuzoka triad, and second phase realists limited reality to shoyo's second category of setai, social mechanisms, I novelists parred reality down to the level of the author's own private thoughts and quotidian reality. 
what Ishikawa calls mindset, kyochi, and daily life, seikatsu, in his essay, Prayer, Norito, and Prose, which I have translated and included in the second half of this book. Having abandoned the traditional East Asian ideal of using art and poetry to pursue the utopian realms of yi jing, or idea scapes, ikkyo in Japanese, and wu wo, and wu wo zhi jing, or selfless states, muga no kyo, muga no sakai, muga no kyo, selfless states. So instead of doing that, writers turn their mimetic gazes first toward broader social realities and then toward their own personal lives, thereby stripping literature of the need to engage with the world of part, past art and literature. Ultimately, these three, the three phases were alike insofar as they each proceeded from the same foundational premise, Shadichugi. To overcome this naive, naively correspondential view of art, Ishikawa believed it was necessary to recover and redeploy the analogical imagination and its key notion of secondary mimesis. These three inaugural iterations of realism went on to lay the groundwork for subsequent developments in literary fiction. The Shajitsushigi paradigm served as the unquestioned starting point for nearly all writers active in the Taisho period and early Showa period. Groups as diverse as the White Birch Circle, the Shirakaba Ha, the proletarian writers, Proletaria Ha, and even the new sensationists, Shinkan Kakuha, can all be said, seen as logical extensions of the first three iterations of realism. For the aristocratic White Birch writers of the Taisho period, the imitation of reality meant the concrete expression of lofty and eternal universalistic humanist ideals. For the revolutionary proletarian writers of the 1920s, it meant the accurate representation of the inexorable logic of class struggle with the specific goal of overthrowing the existing system and replacing it with a more egalitarian society. Even the self-consciously modernist new sensationists believed that the main goal of literature was to transcribe or replicate observable reality, which they conceived in terms of their own immediate sensory experiences, psychological states, and mental impressions. These three initial realist iterations ultimately went on to form the main artery of modern Japanese literature, and it is precisely this main artery that Ishika seeks to cut. Next section, Shajitsu Shugi's detractors. We're almost done here. Ishika was, of course, not the only writer to rebel against the domination of Shajitsu Shugi. The new realist regime encountered its first round of opposition shortly after its appearance, when several writers associated with the Ken Yusha school began challenging the assumptions and methods of Tsubochi Shoyo's embrace of naturalistic, uh, naturalistic depiction and psychological realism. In the so-called debate on literature's extreme decline, Bungak Goksi Ronso of 1889-1890, to 1890, prominent Ken Yusha school affiliates Ozaki Koyo and Shimada Saburo attacked Shoyo's novel of feelings, as vulgar and called for a return to the didactic Yomihon legends and floating world fiction a la Ihara Saikaku that were popular in the Edo period, prompting Yano Ryuke to write his heroic tale Ukishiro Monogatai, the tale of Ukishiro 1890. Another important Ken Yusha associate, associate who took issue with Shoyo's idea that literature must disavow its didactic function was Koda Rohan. In works such as Tai Dokoro, in Karo Skoi, 1990, Rohan used writing as a as a vehicles, a vehicles, as vehicles, a vehicle for artic for the articulating and disseminating of Buddhist teachings and their emancipatory potential, emphasizing especially the notion of shiki soku zeku. All form is emptiness, all emptiness is form, that is central to the Heart Sutra, the Han Ya Shin Gyo. Another writer who objected to the realist consensus was Izumi Kyoka, whose novels such as Koya Hijiri, The Holy Man of Mount Koya, 1900, starkly dramatized the tension between traditional and modern worldviews while borrowing elements from the classical legend of monk Saigyo and the courtesan at Eguchi, Eguchi no Kimi. A, which is a classical uh, legend that I return to in chapter 7 of this book. The most important challenge to realism, however, came from those writers who had been deeply influenced by European symbolism, modernism, modernism's inaugurating phase. 
Symbolism, as I discussed in the introduction, left an indelible mark on an entire generation of fiction writers, including Akhtarar Yunosuke, Tanizaki Jirichiro, Nagai Kafu, Sato Haruo, Kaji Motojiro, Shiga Naoya, Kawabata Yasunari, Uno Koji, and Yokomichi, Yokomitsu Diichi. These writers incorporate symbolist elements and techniques to challenge the major notions of the modern autonomous selfhood, Kindajiga, a stable objective perspective, and unmediated transparency of language. But despite these and other important objections leveled from various literary corners, Shazitsu realism, which was being applied by Futabate Shime, Kunikida Doppo, Masaoka Shiki, Shima, Mura Hogetsu, Tayama Katae, Tokuda Shusei, Natsume Soseki, Shimadaki Tosong, Misa no Koji, Saneyatsu, and others, persisted into subsequent decades, weathering each new round of criticism. And it's precisely this abiding faith in Shadjitsugi, a popular myth, Zokshin, as Ishika calls it in what constitutes his Tanpen Shosetsu, that Ishika sought to expose, interrogate, and destabilize in his early writings. His critical stance vis a vis realism led him to search for alternative modes of representation that might expand rather than diminish literature's horizon of possibilities. But is there something beyond realism? Is realism something that can be superseded, overcome, or transcended? Or is some form of mimetic realism, the direct linguistic representation of some independent or pre-existing world, the ultimate horizon for the modern writer? The answer put forth in Ishikawa's early works is that Shadjitsugi was not the only available mode, that other forms of representation that existed in the past and could still be mobilized in the present. The present study aims to show how Ishikawa's early literary project is, at its core, a critical unmasking of the foundations of modern Japanese literature and a search for alternative thought patterns, hasoho, or modes of artistic creation and interpretation. Ishikawa's antipathy and distrust toward the Shadjitsugi paradigm can be traced to several sources. As I mentioned in Chapter 1, his early education was rooted in the Confucian classics and the Chinese poetic tradition which make a hard distinction between speech, geng, and writing, bung, and tend to conflate primary and secondary mimesis. Another source is the popular ludic literature of the Edo period, which I discuss in depth in Chapter 7. A third source is French literature, in particular symbolist poetry and modernist fiction, such as the self-reflexive Récits, as he called his works, of André Gide. Though a full exploration of the relation between Ishka and Jid lies beyond the purview of this book, we should keep in mind that Ishka's philosophy of the Shosetsu shares much with Jid's notion of the self-reflexive recit, several of which Ishka translated in the interwar period. In the Edouard on the tyranny of resemblance section of Les Faux Monnieuses, for instance, Jid's narrator makes the following manifesto-like pronouncement that anticipates similar statements that appear in Ishka's early work. And I quote from Gide's novel, or Recit, quote, It is because the novel, of all literary genres, is the freest, the most lawless. It is for that very reason, for fear of that very liberty, the artists who are always sighing after liberty are often the most bewildered when they get it, that the novel has always clung to reality with such timidity. And I am not speaking only of the French novel, it is the same with the English novel and the Russian novel, for all its throwing off of constraints is slave to resemblance. The only progress it looks to is to get still nearer to nature. A novel has never known that formidable erosion of contours, as Nietzsche calls it, that deliberate avoidance of life, which gave style to the works of the Greek dramatists, for instance, or to the tragedies of the French 17th century. Is there anything more perfectly and deeply human than these works? But that's just it. They are human only in their depths. They don't pride themselves on appearing so, or at any rate on appearing real. They remain works of art." End quote. Like Gide and Nietzsche, Iska made a sharp distinction between what he regarded as authentic art, which is poetic, a poetic, poetic, world transforming and rooted in a pre-existing tradition, and what he regarded as inauthentic art, which is mere mimesis, mere naturalistic description of observable phenomena based on a disavowal of the four types of literary mediation. <laughs>
In this book, I touch upon the subject of the influences of Gide and Nietzsche on Ishka's works whenever possible, but a full exploration of that subject is a project for another day. Let us turn now to two of Ishka's early mock self-portraits, his debut story Kajing, The Fair One, 1935, and his fantasy Yamazakura, The Wild Cherry Tree, 1936. All right, and that is the end of chapter 2, which is my overview of the origins of Shadetsugi in modern Japan, which is the main target of Ishikawa's early writings, as I argue in this book. That's the end. Hopefully you're able to hear it. I uh, tend to mumble when I'm tired. Hopefully I didn't mumble too much and I uh, may have sat back in my chair uh, too far from the uh, camera, but hopefully it's <clears throat> you're able to make out what I was saying. That is all for now. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.